And so we actually do like to start off these sessions with a group hello. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who is comfortable turning on their camera, this is a great time to do it. It's really nice to actually see faces, uh, even if it's just for a brief moment. So I'm gonna encourage you all to turn on your cameras. Feel free to unmute yourself for a moment and uh, do jazz hands if you've already voted. And you can say, I voted. I voted. I voted. I voted. I voted. Felt so good. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. And now I'm going to share my screen. And welcome you all to our core coffee chat. This is our last one of October, which is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so we're very pleased to have our guests from Monarch Services and Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center joining us today. Uh, we'll introduce them a little bit more in, in just a moment. But for now, I'm Nicole Young, and I'm one of the consultants that facilitates the core investment process, which I'll describe in just a moment. And I'm joined by my colleague today, who is... Nicole Lezen. Welcome, everyone. And again, our colleague who is providing the simultaneous interpretation today is Stella Lauerman. So... Um, big thank you to Stella for joining us for these and doing all the translation of the written materials. Um, and for, th for those of you that are just joining, I do want to go through this one more time really quickly um, about how you can participate in this call today because we have um, simultaneous interpretation available. Uh, you'll need to, to select the language channel that you want to participate in. So if you want to listen in Spanish, uh, just click the globe icon, the interpretation icon, select Spanish and select mute original audio. If you're listening in English, you can just select the English channel. You don't need to select mute original audio. And then we do like to get a sense of which language uh, everyone is participating in. It helps us manage, especially when, we, when it comes time to, for the questions and answers, it helps us to know uh, and be ready for the interpretation. And so we ask you to open your participant list and rename yourself. And so click on the participant icon that looks like people, find your name in the list and hover your mouse over your name and look for the more button. And when you click on that, you should see the option to rename yourself. Uh, if you're on a phone, I believe you just tap your name and, and, and then you see the option to rename. So we're asking you to add some letters after your name, either ENG for English, ESP for Espanol or BIL for bilingual. And again, that just helps us manage the, the conversation when we get to that part. Okay, and then some of you I know are familiar. You've heard us describe CORE already if you've participated on these coffee chats, but we always, we always like to start off with a little overview uh, because we always do have new people joining us in these sessions. So CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. Uh, and it's actually both a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And after a lot of input, we have been, and, and, and I just want to say, Nicole and I do this work on behalf of the County of Santa Cruz, uh, but it's more than just a county-led project. It really, the purpose really is to in, involve and engage many different types of partners and organizations from nonprofits to public agencies to grassroots organizations, um, you know, all, all types of organizations. And so over the last couple of years, we've been able to do that and get a lot of input and ideas about what is it that's needed to uh, achieve this mission and vision that you see on the slide about, you know, inspiring and igniting collective action uh, to create a safe, healthy, equitable community where everyone has opportunities to thrive at ev every stage of life. Those are, those are words uh, and messages that came through loud and clear in several different um, you know, forums or, or these large core conversations that we called them, where we really you know, asked and listened to what is it, what's needed to create that kind of equitable health and well-being. And really, when we when we say equitable health and well-being, we're talking about you know equitable opportunities for people to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. This is basically saying these are things that, as a community, we all need to be able to experience so that 
our outcomes and our opportunities in life can't be predicted for better or worse by things like race or ethnicity, income level, gender identity, uh, and so on. And what we really emphasize in these core coffee chats and core conversations is how interconnected these are. And so today we'll be talking about family violence and how, how issues of safety and well-being are, are being addressed during this time of COVID when you know, there's this shelter in place order in effect. You know, so that falls under uh, this core condition of a safe and just community. But there's so many connections and tie-ins and, and ways that both being in a safe and just community is affected by things like economic security or stable, affordable housing and shelter, um, and how the lack or presence of a safe and just community affects people's ability to live in thriving families and feel connected to their communities and be physically and mentally uh, and emotionally healthy. So again, very much um, you know, in line with today's theme, we wanna look at where the connections are, the intersections are, and that's really one of the main focuses that we, um, that we have in CORE. And you'll notice how this icon for equity is at the center because it means that, again, in order for us to both experience and, and create these equitable opportunities in our community in these eight areas, we have to do it with this explicit understanding that um, both opportunities and outcomes are affected by things like systemic racism and, and structural racism and systemic inequities. And so we, we have to do more than just look at what services are needed, but really what kinds of practices or policy changes um, or systemic level changes are needed to create that vision of equitable health and well-being. So these core coffee chats, which we've been doing pretty much on a weekly basis ever since the end of, of, end of March, are part of what we consider the core institute for innovation and impact. And so this is kind of a, a, a newly developed idea and concept, this core institute. It's a way to bring people together to develop, you know, shared knowledge, um, you know, shared practices to kind of build that uh, collective will to take action um, to create equitable opportunities for health and well-being. And the kinds of topics we focus on through these core coffee chats, through other trainings that might be offered through the Core Institute, you know, it could be anything from focusing on, you know, specific programs and practices to looking at data and evaluation to policy and systems change, to kind of the broader infrastructure and sustainability that's needed so that we have you know, a healthy um, ecosystem of, of services and programs and policies. So you'll hear a lot more about the Court Institute as we continue to develop this concept, um, but that really is kind of how these core coffee chats came to be. You know, they're one of the things that we're able to offer through this Court Institute. And so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Nicole, who's gonna introduce our guests for today. Thanks, Nicole. So we're very pleased to be able to observe Domestic Violence Awareness Month with guests today from two local organizations, Monarch Services and the Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center, who work not only to help survivors of family violence, but to prevent that violence in the first place. So today we'll hear first from Kaylin Foster-Renda, the Acting Executive Director at Monarch Services, and she'll set the stage for us with an overview of domestic violence and mental health in the time of COVID-19, which we're all living through together. And after we hear from Kaylin, we'll have a chance to hear from three advocates, Anna Velasquez, Marjorie Coffey, and Ashley Ponce, who are joining us from Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center. And they'll share some stories and perspectives from their reflections of working directly with survivors as well. And throughout this time, we're going to ask you to share your questions in the chat because after we hear from Kaylin and Anna, Marjorie, and Ashley, we'll have a chance to have all of them respond to your questions um, directly. So we hope to have some interaction after their, their thoughts are shared with us. So keep those questions coming. Nicole and I will gather them and try and route them. And if we don't get to all of them today, we will try to get them answered after our chat and share them with you later. So um, without further ado, Kaylin, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and, and hear from you. 
Great, thank you so much. Thank you for having me and I'm so pleased to be in community with all of you this morning, um, sharing information about domestic violence. Um, I'm going to give you a snapshot. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, just of what I'll be covering today. So we're gonna learn um, briefly about the dynamics of domestic violence, also int intimate partner violence is another um, term that we use and the impact COVID has been having on the survivors in our community in particular. Um, we'll talk about how we have adapted our services as an agency during this time and also talk about the journey to healing because that is the most important piece of this. Um, prevention also, and uh, these two are what we want for our community members. Next slide, please. Great. So just a really brief overview of who Monarch is. Um, we were, when we were founded, we were women's crisis support um, in North County and Defensa de Mahedis in South County. We merged um, about 15 years ago and we were women's crisis support Defensa de Mahedis and then um, adapted our name to Monarch Services to um, have a little bit shorter name uh, and also to reflect the, the people that we were serving. We were starting to serve a lot more males, um, teens, youth, and that this, um, the monarch symbolizes a lot of the work that we do of transformation. We offer an array of bilingual services. Um, all of our services are free and um, we are, we work with domestic violence, sexual assault and human trafficking survivors to help empower them and transform their lives and, and be able to heal from the violence that they've experienced. Um, and one of the largest um, programs that we have is our prevention program. We are focused on youth and the farm worker community in our prevention program. Um, and we are currently doing um, online prevention programs and um, we'll have that information at the end of my presentation. So if you were interested in participating in those educational series, we're doing them monthly. Our mission is lives free from violence and abuse and everything that we do, every uh, decision we make as an agency, every program, it, it stems back to this of this is where we want to get. We all want to work ourselves out of a job and have a community where people feel um, free from the violence that they've experienced. Um, and the vision that we have is to empower individuals, families and our communities to take action against violence and abuse. Next slide, please. So this was uh, 2019 Monarch. Um, we are experiencing a little, something a little bit different in 2020, and I'll talk to you about that in the era of COVID. Um, so when you look at this, we've served uh, 1,600 clients uh, last year. And one, an important figure for you all to know is that one in four women will experience intimate partner violence in their life, and one in seven males will experience intimate partner violence in their lives. So um, there are a few things around this. One is that it takes several times of abuse to happen before somebody comes to report. And for some communities, it does not feel safe to report. And so those um, experiences often go unsaid and um, the healing is not possible because people don't feel comfortable coming forward. 86% um, of the folks that we serve are female, 10% male and 3% trans. We serve 51% of the Latinx community and 19% are white. Um, this number right here, 26% of the clients that we serve are under the ages of 18, and I'm going to talk about that in youth and violence um, quite a bit. And then you can see here, 46% of the clients we serve are from South County. There is a huge disparity. There is increased violence in marginalized communities, and part of that is the Watsonville community. Um, and that is largely due to the social determinants of health not being met in communities, things like um, not, you know, racism being prevalent, not having access to healthy um, and safe housing, not having access to wages that can pay for the, the foundational needs of people, um, having to live in multifamily housing units that are in poor condition. So all of those things directly contribute to the violence um, being escalated in communities. Um, and then 62% of the clients that we serve were domestic violence clients in 2019. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a um, 
definition of what domestic violence is. And I know a lot of us picture somebody having a black eye, seeing physical marks from domestic violence. That is a small portion of what domestic violence looks like in a, in a home. Um, many times financial violence in 94 to 99% of domestic violence situations, financial violence is part of that. And that looks like withholding um, money from people, having control of how things are spent, um, harassing people at workplaces so they're not able to go to work and earn wages. Um, so the control really happens in the financial picture for those families. Uh, and that is very, very common. Um, and emu emotional abuse as well. Um, and something that's important to know is in domestic violence households, 90% of the homes um, where domestic violence is occurring, children are present or are witnessing that violence. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 um, and how this is impacting survivors of domestic violence. And I will share with you, and I know um, the advocates at Walnut Avenue will also um, echo this in that we have seen huge increases in the number of clients that we're serving. And that's in, in particular domestic violence for us. Um, when we went into shelter in place in mid-March, we all started working remotely. We started seeing our clients um, over Zoom and sometimes over uh, the telephone, if that was what was accessible. Uh, during that time, we collect data all the time, but we then started reviewing our data on a weekly basis because we were worried about some of the clients that we were serving and their ability to be able to access services. Um, one of our greatest fears was we are now all sheltered in place and many of us, um, most of our clients are not sheltered in a safe place. And so how will they reach out? How will they be able to get services? And so we really needed to monitor um, who is accessing services and who is not uh, based on our, our data. And what we found is that we had a huge drop off in the number of children that we were serving. And we had a huge drop off in the number of monolingual Spanish speaking clients that we were serving. So as soon as it was safe to do so, right around June, we opened our offices up to be able to see uh, children and to be able to see monolingual Spanish speakers or people that had barriers to technology or lived in multifamily housing units and didn't have a safe space to be able to speak to a case manager. Um, so we are still offering most of our services remotely, including our support groups, with the exception of those people that are not able to access services um, in a safe way. Um, and, and for most of the children, we're seeing them in our uh, in our offices to be able to, it just does not work over Zoom very well at all. Um, so they have the option to be able to use the phone or video, our clients, um, and we are, we provide technology for those folks that need technology and, and are able to use it. Um, our shelter numbers have increased dramatically. So just to give you a picture, when we, um, in February, we were serving about 20 families a month in our shelter. Right now, we have about 76 families that we are, um, we, we do a motel voucher program to be able to quarantine for two weeks and then bring them into shelter or find them safe housing. Um, and that is a huge piece of the work that we have been doing. Um, I will tell you uh, the number of crisis line calls that we've had has increased by 40% over this time period. Um, and the number of new clients that have come in and have continued with services, so that's 12 sessions or more, has increased by 20%. Um, so we are seeing huge numbers uh, in our domestic violence, which Sounds weird, but we were happy to see that because it meant that people were able to access us, the, the creative ways that people were being able to call our crisis line saying, I need help, um, was just astounding to us. Um, and so it, we, we really felt comfortable that if most of the people that needed to access us were, um, and part of the first thing that we do when somebody calls us is to be able to put a safety plan together for that person. So so those things answer like, if I need to leave my house immediately, where are my car keys? Where will I have cash? Where can I go? These things that there is a plan in place um, and, and people know wh what their options are should they need to leave immediately. Um, and of course, our crisis line is staffed 24 hours a day um, and we are we have four advocates on at all times. Uh, and, and at this point, we are just busier than we have ever been. Um, so far this month, so in a typical month, we're serving right around 100 to 120 individuals. As of last Thursday, we had served 183. So it, the numbers are just um, 
as I have said, you know, going up dramatically. And we saw this when there are economic pressures, when there are social pressures, um, the mental health of our community has been deeply affected by COVID. And we are seeing that within um, the, the community that we serve. We will see those domestic violence numbers goes up, go up. During the Great Recession, we saw the same thing. The severity of abuse increases. Um, and those stressors really create, just compound what was already existing. Um, and so we expect for these numbers to stay consistently high for a long period of time until um, the, the, both the stressors of COVID um, let go, but also the clients that we serve, as I had mentioned, you know, there's a higher incidence in marginalized communities. Those communities are also some of the communities that have experienced job loss. Um, they have experienced their, you know, the essential workers that have had to be on the front lines of COVID. Um, they're the farm worker community that hasn't missed a day who are working working in, um, you know, dangerous conditions as far as with COVID being present, as well as then our community experienced fires. And so they're working in the fields with fires. So these stressors directly contribute to violence occurring in the home. Um, and so it, it's important to understand that when a community isn't meeting the social determinants of health, as I had mentioned earlier, that there isn't I'll give you an example of this. So we have um, many families that are farm worker families that are single parent families because they've experienced domestic violence and they've been, we have a housing program, we've been able to get them in housing. They then have three small children who they're trying to educate at home um, because of, of COVID. They've now had to let go of their job. So then they move back in with the person who's done harm in the past. The, we are seeing this over and over again because of lost wages, because of having to take care of children where there aren't um, you know, solutions in place for that. And the individuals that suffer, and I think both Nicole's mentioned this, this is always present in our community. This is not unique to COVID. So the people that um, experience hardship with poverty, with racism, with um, not having safe access to physical and mental, mental health care, those all are still present multiplied by many. <laughs> so all of those issues are just been exacerbated by COVID. And if there's a silver lining to any of this, what I do see from our community is we cannot turn a blind eye anymore. We are seeing this now. We are seeing the violence increase. We have seen that in our community over the past two weeks. Um, we've had domestic violence homicide. We had two homicides in Watsonville last weekend. That is present. And it's, it's always there, but COVID has just magnified it. And if anything, I feel like we now, the community sees the resources that are needed um, and being able to provide the resources of taking care of our children and making sure that they have safe activities and quality childcare and uh, a safe place to go. We have been, um, during the time of COVID, that's another community that we've been extremely concerned about because typically a child is going into a classroom, they're seeing their teacher, they're seeing counselors within the school and staff and people that are those trusted adults in a child's life can tell something's not right. We need to get involved. We're seeing this person is sleeping during class or they have a mark on their face or they're isolating or they're acting out in class. That's not present now because of social distance learning. Um, and so we now are the community. We are the eyes that need to speak up when we see our neighbors, when we see people in community, when we're seeing them, you know, if we're working at dentist and the, in the dental chair, getting their dental checkup and we're noticing something isn't right. Um, we all are the guardians of our community members that um, have you know, or can experience this. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about healing. Healing is possible. Um, it's more than possible. Um, but as I've been, you know, on my bandwagon here, those, those things that are foundational to a human being being able to um, prosper in their life have to be met. And those, the first thing, when somebody comes into our agency, Yes, we are doing safety planning first and foremost, but the very next thing that we're doing is making sure that the folks that are in our agency have 
housing, have food security, have access to quality childcare, mental, mental and physical health care, and economic security. Most of them do not. And so that's the first thing that we do. We case manage them um, for a year or more. We make sure that we can get them into housing. Um, that has been a huge program for us over the past two years. And we all know finding um, safe and secure housing in Santa Cruz County at an affordable rate is quite a feat. Um, and so we've been really creative with that. And it, it has been the greatest success we have ever seen as, a, as an agency in seeing people be able to eliminate violence from their lives. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're leaving the person that's done harm. If that person is able to get into quality programming um, and be able to heal that themselves and understand their behaviors and have better um, better behaviors to adapt to stressors, um, you know, that is very possible. And we see that with our, our client families all the time. Um, but those things absolutely have to be met. That's the foundation to set a healing. And then we can work on the psychological trauma. And that's really being able to meet survivors where they're at. Every survivor that walks through our door is in a different place. And it is up to us to be able to offer the menu of these are the options available to you and then allowing that survivor to be in the driver's seat it that is these that is one of the most important parts of the healing journey is empowering them to make the decisions to have control over their lives because that has been lost in so many cases especially with domestic violence um and being able to give services to children is absolutely the key. So as I had mentioned, 90% um, of the homes there are children present and they witness that violence. That cycle of violence is very real. Um, the children that experience violence in the home, we know, um, but by the ACEs study have many um, bad outcomes uh, for them as they grow into adulthood. And that could be um, getting involved in the justice system, um, being abusers themselves, being abused. Um, and so being able to access those services and help children develop healthy coping skills, help them develop um, healthy ways to be able to uh, basically express themselves, anger management, and also heal the trauma from seeing violence in the home. Um, and, and that is one of the key, key parts of our, our work. Um, and the last part is community connection. We know that when we are able to put um, survivors with family members or with community and the community wraps around those survivors, the success is so much more than um, we could ever, you know, express to you um, if that isn't present. So we are the community. We need to wrap around those marginalized and those people that have been hurt um, in our community and, and be able to offer them hope and, and see them <laughs> and hear them and um, give them a, a healthy space to prosper and grow. Um, so community connection is absolutely paramount in the healing journey. Next slide. And then I know you're gonna do questions in the chat and I'm, um, I'm super excited to answer. Um, as I mentioned, we do have, our prevention team is putting on monthly uh, talks and educational series and that you can find that um, on our website and also all of our social media that's there. This month it's on domestic violence um, and so it's it's um, getting really deep into the dynamics of domestic violence and mental health um, in particular during the time of COVID. So uh, you will find that information there. And I thank you. Thank you, Kaylin. So please keep your questions coming in the chat and we'll try and share those with Kaylin and the advocates who you'll hear from, you'll hear from next. And uh, that was just a great overview and a, a lot of insights into some of the, the ways all these things are connected as well as how they're really intensified during the time of COVID. So now we're gonna have a chance to hear, as I mentioned earlier, from three advocates from the Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center. So Ashley, could I start with you, um, if you want to unmute yourself? And I wondered if you had some reflections on what Kaylin said, examples from survivors you've worked with or, or ways that those of us on, on the chat can help support your work um, in specific ways. 
Um, yeah. So at Walnut Avenue, I do facilitate our um, domestic violence support group on Monday nights. And a reoccurring theme since COVID has hit. Um, so our virtual support groups are now done through Zoom. So that's have still been carrying on. And something that keeps coming up is the financial struggles. Most of our, you know, participants are single parents, single mothers, and due to COVID, um, they're, some have lost their jobs or relying on unemployment, their hours have cut back, and they haven't had contact with their, you know, ex-partners, their abusive exes, and now they're found in this, you know, difficult situation of, I, I need to provide, you know, um, food security for my kids. Should I reach out to my ex-partner? I'm kind of scared how they'll react. I haven't talked to them in a while he isn't involved in their life and uh, in this is discussion is going on in uh, our support group so it's it's common it's happening and people are like should I just go back with my ex um, what does the child support um, process look like and us as advocates we're providing that safety plan of let's get that worry um, support let's build on, you know, child support. Let's safety plan on how you can communicate with your ex if you want to. Let's get other resources um, for you so you can um, provide that food security for your family, for your kids without um, getting back in that, you know, abusive relationship. Um, but these concerns, these COVID escalations is very prevalent in our support groups as well. Those are some of their stories that's happening. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Marjorie, I wonder, would you like to reflect as well and, and share some of what you've been experiencing? Sure. Um, Survivors? Sure. Uh, so I provided direct service actually only up through January or February, uh, just before quarantine started. Yeah. Um, yeah. And since then, most of my focus has been on uh, prevention education. And, some of the, and being one of the social media folks. And what I've noticed in that particular lens has been a growing awareness as, as community conversations around like the role of policing, um, the, the direct correlation that Kaylin touched on with, you know, like it's not an accident that people who have multiple, excuse me, that people who have vulnerable identities are statistically more likely to experience domestic violence. Like there is an inherent connection, direct connection between socio-political vulnerability and personal vulnerability um, and the experiences of those violences. Um, and so as mainstream conversations and community conversations have changed around being more critical maybe of some of the status quo that we're so used to in our systems, I'm seeing a lot of push and desire for change. Um, in a way that hasn't been as outspoken as it has been in a while. Um, I see people who want to be allies who are posting on social media about domestic violence in ways that are really well-intentioned but are ultimately uninformed and could actually cause more harm. Um, I see the desire, I see the silencing of survivors because when they are at home, when they have fewer ways to, to justify um, leaving a shared space with their abuser, with the person causing harm. Um, I don't see as many voices that are able to speak up. They don't have the same access to the platforms online or in person that they did before. And so there's been kind of this interesting shift of allies being more outspoken and survivors, I'm not seeing as, um, it's harder for them to communicate directly in their own words what they actually need and what is actually helpful. And so um, my, my takeaway from this has been wanting to encourage people to not let the momentum fade because there is still so much work to do. There has always been work to do that to take advantage of the prevention, uh, excuse me, the prevention opportunities offered by Walnut Avenue and by Monarch to take advantage to, you know, domestic violence touches every aspect of our lives. Um, Kaylin mentioned, you know, one in four women, one in seven men, and that's just the, the statistical research. Those are the people who disclosed, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, those numbers are guaranteed to be higher, and that's only in the general population. When you look at 
uh, more specific demographics, the numbers absolutely are higher. To be a trans person of color is one of the most dangerous identities to have. Um, over half of people who are trans experience specifically sexual violence from an int intimate partner, let alone the other possible forms of domestic violence. And so my hope is that under COVID, under the protests that have come out of George Floyd's murder and all of the social movements and pressures that people will recognize that you don't have to be an advocate to be an advocate. <laughs> you know, you don't have to be employed in our, in our industry. Um, that we, that both Walnut Avenue and Monarch are happy to come into faith groups, into schools, into wherever you will give us a space. Let us know what kind of information you want that is most helpful and we will do that. Um, and I think that is one of the most helpful things is, I do believe that education is one of the most self-empowering things but also recognizing that a lot of times education comes with barriers, a lot of classism and a lot of um, accessibility issues. And so by lowering those barriers and, uh, and bringing in opportunities for education to know, oh, that's what I'm experiencing. Oh, that's what my friend is going through. Oh, now I know how I might respond in a way that is safe. I think that is one of the most effective things that we can do as a community and kind of lower some of the typical barriers that have been in place, you know, um, start breaking down some of the silos of education and knowledge and awareness. So, okay, great. Check. Thanks, Marjorie. I see a lot of questions coming in and we'll get to them in just a moment about some specifics about how people can respond in, in helpful ways as opposed to unhelpful ways. So hold that thought. But um, Anna, I wanted to give you a chance to reflect as well on some of the things that you're hearing that are maybe specific to COVID, but um, bringing forth things that have been there all along, as Kaylin mentioned. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one of the things that um, I have seen uh, with a lot of current and former clients is that the stressors for COVID are um, posing a really negative um, impact on their mental health. Um, this is even more so with folks that, you know, have been, I haven't heard from for a while. It seemed like they had moved on to bigger and better things, but now because of this pandemic, they're reaching back out to me and saying, Anna, I'm feeling really triggered. I need your help. Or can I, can, can you connect me with some mental health resources? So that's very real. Um, one of the things I also wanted to um, acknowledge is that especially due to COVID and because of a lot of the discourse going on in politics. A lot of uh, survivors have reported, especially those that I work with, that a lot of the language that's being used by um, certain uh, political figures um, is very triggering language that takes them back to the same um, verbiage that was utilized by their abusive partners either in the past or that has been used, you know, most recently towards them. And I also, you know, again, that's something also to be mindful that it's not just COVID uh, impacting survivors. It can also be this very triggering language that's being used in the sort of public discourse that people don't realize, realize how um, similar it can be to the language that um, folks who behave in an abusive way um, utilize against um, survivors. The other thing I also wanted to uh, mention too is the aspect of financial abuse. Um, that's something that a lot of survivors, especially now that um, their hours are being cut, they're being laid off of work, that now um, they're being put in a position where again, as uh, some of the other uh, Kayleen uh, and Ashley and Marjorie have mentioned, where they're having to ask their abusive ex for financial support for their children, or even um, fi go finally move forward with a divorce case and see if they can get spousal support. And this is so uh, sometimes a lot of the opportunities that uh, folks who are abusive will utilize as a way to uh, weaponize child support, uh, spousal support, or even informal uh, financial arrangements uh, in in order to utilize that against survivors. Um, one of the other things too that's really common um, and I, I've heard from a lot of survivors recently is the issue of identity theft by uh, their abusive partner. So that is something that is quite worrisome. It's also an easy way for somebody to sabotage somebody's chances of being able to leave a relationship successfully and reestablish themselves you know, and rent an apartment 
you cannot rent an apartment if your credit is absolutely destroyed, right? Um, and it's been really common, not just with um, survivors of intimate partner violence, but I also see this a lot as a person that works with young people. I see identity theft happen uh, for young people at the hands of their abusive parents. And that's also something to be aware of, you know, if a, if a lot of you work with young people that this might be something that young people will need support around because especially young people or even sur even survivors who maybe were really sheltered didn't have an opportunity to gain basic financial literacy information that they are going to need a lot of support in getting some of those basics down and also needing guidance on how can I rem remedy this. I just recently had to support a survivor on a step-by-step -step process of how can I address I this identity theft, how can I freeze my credit? Um, how do I reach out to the three credit bureaus, right? Um, and it's so important that, you know, us as allies in the community, if you know you have that expertise, um, whether it's for financial literacy, um, credit 101, um, budgeting, that if a, you notice that a survivor is in need of that information, please do, uh, I would encourage you to, you know, provide us an accessible way of survivors receiving that kind of education because, you know, again, knowledge is power. And people who are um, abusive like to capitalize on the fact that uh, a survivor does not have knowledge and therefore doesn't have power in that situation. Yeah, I can imagine all those things are difficult enough in the best of times. And when you're under stress and marginalized, even more of a nightmare. Um, Anna, you mentioned that some of the, the language that's being used in public discourse um, is triggering. And we had a question specifically mm -hmm. about that. So I just wanted to give you a chance to mm -hmm. address that. Um, can, can you offer some examples? So, that so you, know? Um, you know, so for instance, uh, one of the, and this is just, again, an anecdote from a survivor. But um, at least the survivor mentioned that a lot of the language that's being used by uh, President Trump specifically and the Trump campaign uh, happened to hearken a lot of the language that had been utilized by her abusive partner specifically. Uh, a lot of it tended to be all, a lot of this sort of shifting the narrative around specific events. So for instance, if at first he said one thing about, you know, the COVID response, right? And then during his next rally or during the next interview, he says something completely different in the way that he's shifting the responsibility away from him, from his, I guess, leadership uh, role in the situation to towards other people, towards other entities. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's this is a very common response from um, people who behave in an abusive way. They're very um, accountability adverse. Yeah. And a lot of the times, it, again, a lot of survivors are very well versed in that um, sort of um, reversal of roles, right? Where a lot of the times the language and the counter narrative that somebody who's abusive will say to survivors or to other people um, turns the situation where um, the abuser will paint themselves as victim. And what they will then paint the survivor or another third party or another situation as the, per, as the entity of blame for the harm that was done. And so that hearing- all familiar. Of, yes. And yeah. so a lot, so again, hearing a lot of this language in the bigger sort of social political discourse is yeah. making it also really hard for um, survivors to be as um, politically engaged as well. A lot of them have told me that they have to, you know, only, they're only capable of just reading small excerpts of especially what, um, you know, the Trump campaign and he has to say on certain issues or even other political figures say, because again, they're trying to find that balance of, of political engagement while maintaining their mental well-being. This is a, a particular week for that, that yes. insight. Yeah, I could see that, how the gaslighting in a personal life could be reflected in, in the public sphere. So thanks for sharing that. Um, before we open up to more questions, I wanted to give you each, Ashley, Marjorie, Anna, and Kaylin, uh, uh, if you had a suggestion for how people can be most helpful. I know you've all 
um, woven that into your comments already. So is there something else that, that you think um, you'd like to leave people with as a, as a suggested action or a different way of interacting with people or supporting your organizations that you'd like to share right now? Ashley? Um, yeah, something that comes to mind is um, a very common myth is that if they wanted help, they would ask for it. And it's not that easy. A survivor might just feel um, not comfortable confiding in anyone, not just you in particular, and they might not understand what's going on in their situation. So something that we have seen that is very useful is talking to them about domestic violence in a very general way and just letting them know that um, you're concerned um, about people who get abused and that you don't blame survivors for the violence. And just coming from that place of understanding instead of kind of saying, oh, I know you're in this situation or like um, instead of just already coming in with those like beliefs and misconceptions, just kind of letting them know in general, I support survivors and giving them that safe space to open up and to talk whenever they feel comfortable enough. Great, thank you. It's a great practical suggestion for removing <laughs> judgment as much as you can, right? Yeah. Marjorie, how about you? Do you have a, a specific ask or, or suggestion for how people can interact and support survivors? I think the checking your own agenda because whether you're talk as a loved one, if you're trying to support someone you care about who's going through domestic violence, it's easy to want to insert your own belief on what safety looks like for them, that you can accidentally disempower them and, con and contribute to that cycle of, of disempowerment. And I think it's also true for a lot of our political engagement, um, recognizing the need for change, the necessity for change, but not being so invested in what the, in the specifics of what that looks like, that you're blind to the possibilities of what a collaborative solution looks like. Allowing survivors to, even if when you don't agree, allowing survivors to be the leader in their own process. And um, when it comes to communities, recognizing that not everybody has a lived experience, but all lived experiences are relevant to a community's health. So I think in both scales of engagement, um, being, being open to other perspectives, but also being critical and what that balance looks like so that you can still engage and still call people in when mistakes are made, but allow mistakes to be made as learning opportunities and growth and accountability. Okay, great, thanks for that. Kaylin, what's on your mind? So much. <laughs> I appreciate <laughs> all of those wonderful questions and insight. Um, I, I think uh, as a community, uh, there are a few things that we can do immediately. Um, one of them is definitely being an active bystander. If you see, see something, say something, especially when it comes to children. Um, I, I think that many times, you know, we see the person who's been harmed um, and we forget about the children. Um, even when law enforcement gets involved in domestic violence situations, very rarely are the children interviewed as part of that process. And that's one way to get services to uh, the children of that family. Um, so really see when you see something, say something. And the other part is, you know, question what the norms have been. Um, and let's look at everything with an equity lens. So a perfect example of this that has happened in the time of COVID was 63% of the population of South County has, uh, of the COVID cases have come from South County. So 63% of the funding that has come through the CARES Act has needed to go to South County. That's an equitable way to spend money. And that's what we should be doing as well. So those marginalized communities, we can put money to where they need to go. Um, equ equity does not mean that everybody gets an equal slice of the pie. Equity means that the people that need it most get the most. And that's what we should be doing to be able to stop the violence from occurring in the first place. Um, okay. So that's, a, I, I know, a big agenda item, but we have, you know, every, every transformation starts with one step and this is our first step and, and we are on our way and things like CORE make that possible. So thank you to both the Nicoles for making that happen and being the voice of that. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, and I'll give you a quick chance to weigh in. I know, I know we have to move on to some other questions as well, mm -hmm. but that will be a perfect seg if you want to share yes. your... So I would say uh, the biggest thing, especially whether it's, uh, especially for those that want to help somebody in their life that's going to, or who they suspect is going through domestic violence, one of the things would be to be patient. 
uh, with the survivor. Um, sometimes survivors are not ready yet and or are not in a good mental headspace yet to really come to terms with the fact that the person that they love and care for is also perfectly capable of causing them indescribable harm. And again, that is that is a, a major realization that takes it it's its own process to go um, to undergo and um, that they have to come to terms with themselves. And, um, you know, so one of the things would be to be patient and just to let the survivor know, hey, I'm here for you uh, whenever you need me. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to be a listening ear and a support person because, again, um, just statistically speaking, it takes a pr at least seven attempts for a survivor before they're able to successfully leave a relationship, right? And so again, part of those attempt, one of those prior, att prior attempts is, okay, I left, but now I can't turn my feelings off, like off a switch. I can't turn off the love and care I have for this person, even though yes, they have hurt me this much. We have children involved. I have spent maybe even decades with this person, right? So there's also that time and energy investment aspect as well that they're having to contend with. So just be patient. And also it's okay for you if you feel like maybe you've done everything that you could and that this survivor maybe isn't still in a good place um, to leave yet. Again, as Marjorie said, be mindful of what agenda you're using going into things. And it's okay for you to take a step back and just let them know, hey, if you need any further help, like I don't have the bandwidth for it, but here's the contact information for Monarch and Walnut Avenue. And they, you would be working with professionals that would be able to provide you with specialized support. It's a great suggestion. And it's complicated, doesn't even begin to cover it, right? Well, thanks for that. So Nicole's gonna share some of the questions that have been coming up in the chat and we'll, give you each um, a chance to let us know who wants to chime in. And again, if we don't get to all of them in the time we have left, we will try and gather responses from, from everyone to get back to you in written form later. So thanks to each of you. That was really enlightening and, and some specific action steps for each of us. We really appreciate it. And several of them actually, you, you've all been doing a nice job of uh, addressing as you've been kind of sharing your thoughts and, and doing your presentations. And so the questions I'll pose are maybe just asking for a few more examples. Um, but let me pause first and ask, are there any participants on the Spanish channel that would like to ask a question in Spanish? And I'm gonna say if you would like to um, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself so we know. So we'll give it just a moment to see. I'm scrolling through the participants. Okay. Um, and again, feel free to, to keep asking your questions in the chat if you want in English or Spanish. Um, and so there are a couple of questions that were coming through in the chat about, you know, really wanting to know like what can people do as community members or even as other service providers. We got some of these questions in the registration form as well about, you know, what, what can people do in their roles, either as a community member or service provider to offer support, especially if someone isn't ready yet or if someone is saying, I just wanna move on and not be sad. Um, so you've given us some really good examples of phrases to use like, um, I'm here for you, you know, if you ever, if you ever need to talk to someone, uh, if you ever, you know, when you're ready, here are some resources. Can you, can any of you offer some more examples of just helpful phrases? Because it is really hard, right, to, to even recognize when we might be saying something with our own agenda. And so like, you know, Marjorie, that, you know, you made some great points about um, being aware of that and pausing that. Um, and at the same time, when someone cares so deeply or wants so much to help or knows that they have like, you know, a 15 minute appointment with someone and, and that's their opportunity to offer some resources and support, like what are some of those helpful phrases that people might be able to kind of remember and use in those moments? Marjorie, you wanna go first? Uh, I believe you, I love you. Um, I'm glad you're with me, I'm glad you're here just general affirming things. Um, domestic violence can often undermine someone's sense of worthiness. They may blame themselves for the violence. And so non-judgmental 
language of, yeah, I believe you. I love you. Thank you for being my friend slash, you know, I'm glad you're my sister. I'm glad you're my brother, whatever it might be. Um, and when, if someone says, uh, also, I don't blame you. Um, if someone starts going into self-blame spirals or um, if not judging them for their decisions, don't do that, I told you so. I told you that wasn't a good relationship. I told you about that person, I warned you. None of the blaming language, because what we wanna focus on is stay present focused and moving forward, not what coulda, woulda, shoulda. That's not helpful at this point. So, and generally speaking, those kinds of things are better addressed with either an advocate or a mental health professional who can be a little more objective and get a little deeper into some of those particulars as a support person, unless the survivor wants that kind of engagement stay present focused. Um, you're having a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. That wasn't fair. You deserved better. Those kinds of affirmations can be helpful. Yeah, it's a really powerful, even just that, um, you know, I believe you, right? When you said that, I got chills. So yeah, so even simple statements like that can be really powerful, even if they don't, um, you know, create the immediate change that maybe someone else uh, wants to see. So thank you for that. I'm gonna actually try to fit in a couple more questions here and then uh, maybe ask different ones of you to, to take the first pass at answering them. So we have a couple questions here about how we can best support youth in our community who are experiencing domestic violence, um, either where they're experiencing it themselves or there was another question also about like where they're living in families where that's happening. Um, who would like to address that one? Ashley, Kaylin, or Anna? How about one of you, how about Anna? Yeah, so for uh, Walnut Avenue, we do offer a virtual youth group, uh, and this is open to both um, uh, young people that are uh, from domestic violence homes or young people that just need a, com a virtual community space and uh, a place to de-stress and relax. So we have that option available for youth, um, you know, and it's virtual and most youth usually have either uh, some sort of uh, smart device at, uh, at hand in order to access some of these things. We also offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring for young people and uh, for young people um, in case they are in an unsafe home situation we are able to they are able to still access some of that mentoring um, service without parental consent um, particularly you know again if it would be a little bit uh, of a dangerous situation if they were trying to seek out these services and then they had to ask the for consent from pot a potentially unsafe parent right um, so we are able to offer that as um, option, uh, whether it's through Zoom or over the phone, whatever would work best for them. Or even in some case by case um, basis, we are able to offer it in person, just, you know, adhering to physical distancing measures and all of that. Uh, and we also at in, uh, through Walnut Avenue, we do have a prevention um, TikTok where we're posting a lot of videos, um, just posting general information around um, just self-care, um, healthy and unhealthy relationships, boundaries. Um, and again, if the young person is on TikTok, uh, our, our, our account on there is Walnut Avenue for Youth. And, uh, you know, in case maybe one-on-one -on -one mentoring or the, the virtual youth group is not safe for them to access the if they have a TikTok account that they're able to to use themselves you know just for fun they're still able to access at least some resources in a way that they can also um, quickly disguise from an unsafe partner or um, an unsafe parent. Great thank you Anna and I'm going to fit in one more question um, and this one's going to be for Kaylin and while we're while Kaylin's answering this, we're gonna post some information about again upcoming sessions to register for. I just posted the link to the feedback survey for today, so please make sure you click on those links. Um, but what I wanted to mention that before I ask this last question. So, Kaylin, there's a question specifically for you about um, what about help and healing for the people who do harm to help stop these cycles of violence and abuse because we know that hurt people hurt other people. And so there's a question, an interest in hearing you talk more about the work that Monarch does in that area. Sure, so we have a program that we launched about a year ago called Positive Solutions. And what we found in talking to survivors uh, 
is that many times they want their families to be able to stay together. Um, and the other piece is, is the a person who's done harm moves on to other relationships and is continues the cycles of abuse. So we offer a program that is based on healing the person who has done harm, having um, anger management skills that uh, are able to address the way that they are dealing with escalated situations. Um, and the number one thing that, that is important to know about the person who's done harm is research shows that their ACEs score, and that's a little like um, thing that you'll be excited to see on November 12th with the Nicoles, but is exponentially higher typically than even the person that has been hurt, the survivor. So childhood trauma plays a huge part in this. Um, and being able to offer healing resources that are non-shaming. Um, so often the person who's done harm is continuously shamed, which just exacerbates negative behaviors and perpetuates cycles. And so we are able to offer this programming. It is free of charge. Um, and it is also tailored, it, typically a batter's intervention program, which that has been called, has been a 52-week program. But because the County of Santa Cruz is in a pilot program with the state. We are able to tailor the programming to meet the person's need and the recommendation of either the probation officer or CPS or um, you know somebody that that's self referred. So that is just a little sliver of the program. Um, but basically, it's based on strengths um, and finding strengths and being able to communicate and uh, effectively and in a healthy way. And so that is the model that we believe in and that we believe will, um, you know, end cycles of violence. So thank you for that question, Dr. Green. Thank you, Kaylin. That's so interesting to hear. Um, and so I just want to say we are officially at our end time. Um, if our guests are able to stand for just a few minutes more, there is a question about safety planning with clients while sheltering in place. Um, and Barry, if you're still able to stay on, then you'll get to hear an answer to that. Um, but for everyone else, I know that sometimes people have to leave right at, at, right at 11. So we are officially done. But for those of you that would like to stand for a few minutes more, um, I'm wondering, Kaylin and Anna and Marjorie and Ashley, can you say a little bit about what safety planning looks like with clients who are sheltering in place? Yes. Um, and specifically, like how it's different because of COVID. Right. So I think, you know, for us, what we see is this is step one, for sure, in being able to, if we just have a finite amount of time with somebody um, that's called our crisis line or, or is able to meet with a case manager, um, the safety plan is absolutely key to, it, it's been said many times, but it's very often that people that are in a domestic violence situation, they normalize that violence. Um, and so being able to show um, through a safety planning process that this, you are in danger, in fact, because so many people don't understand that. Um, and so it empowers the individual to make decisions um, and to be able to have a plan in place that empowers them to leave should they need to. Um, and so it, it really is tailored to that person um, and what their needs are, if they have children, if they have um, family or friends in the community, but it's really identifying those things. So the, the top the, are access to funds, access to, to a safe place to go, um, knowing where the car keys are, having a second location of car keys, perhaps with a neighbor should you need them or hidden in you know, a bush, but some safe way to be able to leave a situation should it escalate. Um, and part of that too is being able to leave conversations as they start to escalate, You know, being able to walk away from it. Um, so there are a number of factors that go into place and every situation is different, but it is extremely important. Um, and they have the National um, Resource for Domestic Violence has a safety plan template on their website that you can absolutely, you know, access to be able to use. I do recommend getting some training around it because it's important for case management and advocates to see some red flags um, as, you know, people are answering them. But if there is nothing else, there is that template that can be utilized and um, at least there's some kind of a plan in place. One of the okay. other things, at least, that we at Walnut Avenue recommend is having a go bag with, um, I, 
identification, um, really vital documents like a social security number, insurance cards for themselves and their children, uh, medications if um, they have a chronic condition that they need uh, medication to manage, and just a couple sets of clothing. Um, one of the things that um, has actually been sort of like a blessing in disguise of the wildfires that we recently had here is that a lot of survivors now have an easier time creating a go bag, even right in front of their abusive partner, because they're utilizing disaster preparedness as the pretext for it. And um, this is something that with a lot of survivors that I've currently worked with, they um, presented um, their go bag in this way to their children who they knew that their abusive partner was going to sort of follow up uh, with the children of what is what is mom doing. Um, so again, utilizing any other sort of um, a seemingly mundane reason to create like a go bag again like as Kayleen said making sure that you um, they have funds available or that they're connecting with family or friends who would be able to provide them with financial support especially if um, their fine their uh, bank accounts their credit cards are close closely monitored by their um partner, one of the other things we encourage folks to do in those instances would be if they go grocery shopping, um, get a small amount of money through cash back um, as they're uh, checking out uh, from the store, you know, and make, paying for their groceries because on the bank statement, it's just going to show, oh, well, you spend X amount of money at Safeway. And it's not going to show that along with the groceries that were being paid for, um, they also withdrew um, a small amount of money. So they, this is something that we can support survivors at developing you know, a long-term plan. But it, again, the safety plans really hinge upon what does the survivor want to do? Do they, are they at the point in, um, in their life where they still want to stay in the relationship either for um, due to emotional reasons or due to very practical reasons like I have no family, I have nowhere else to go um, af if I were to leave, right? Uh, so then the safety plan for that situation is going to look very different than the safety plan for somebody who is actively working towards leaving or who has just left and all they need to do is just um, have a safety plan in, in place in case their abusive partner um, tries to retaliate against them for having left their relationship. Thank you. That was, uh, both of those were really helpful answers. And I see that Kaylin uh, posted the link to a safety, safety plan template in the chat box as well. So we'll also include that in our follow-up email with links to different resources and um, as well as the recordings of today's session. Um, I think that that is probably all we have time for today. I know there were a couple more questions in the chat that are coming through. We'll, um, we'll ask our guests to help kind of provide their thoughts or ideas about those. But uh, for today, I think we will say goodbye and say, say hello to the... <laughs> little one appearing on screen. We always, <laughs> we always like that. Um, so thank, I just want to say all thank you. you all. Yes, thanks so much for um, preparing such, you know, thorough and helpful presentations and sharing so many of your insights and experience that I think all of us have benefited from. So thank you. There are lots of thank yous coming through in the chat. And thank you all to, to those of you that are still with us for joining us for this for today's coffee chat and we look forward to seeing you at a future one. And thank you Stella for the translation. I'm, I'm sure there's some survivors out there who are going to benefit from all of you being here today. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Take care. <laughs>